Good morning, y'all. Hey, I am so excited to see you this morning. Um, my name is Teresa. I used to be one of the team members here at South Point, but now I live in the great state of Texas. Yeah, any Texans in here? Woohoo! You'll find one in every bunch, won't you? You'll find one in every bunch. Well, I am so excited to be back in Southern Maryland where my family and I have so many wonderful memories of our time here. How long did we live here, babe? Like, um, <laughs> Warren said forever. Uh, 13 years or forever, same thing. Um, but my husband retired a couple years ago from, I don't know, you might have heard of it, the Navy. Yeah, he, he retired from the Navy and um, we decided that we would move back to Texas where we were stationed before we came here. And um, it's great, I love it, but it's really hot. It's really hot. It's hot up here right now. And anybody else in here kind of warm? Mm-hmm, yeah, it's a little warm. But let me tell you, it's not Texas hot. It's not, te this last week we were at 111. That was the temp, not the heat index. Look at me using science words before 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Look at that, that is awesome. Well, you know, um, I, I don't know about you, but I, I love to tell stories. And so if you don't like stories, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be really boring for you today. But I really, really like to tell stories. And I don't know, I was just wondering, have, is there anything that you have ever wanted to try but didn't think maybe you could? You know, something you wanted to try but you didn't think you could? Or maybe other people would look at you and say, you can't do that. That's not who you are. It, have you ever had that experience? Well, there's something that I need to confess to all of my Southern Maryland people because you may or may not know this about me. Oh, wait a minute, I wanna take a quick minute. Hi, Lesby. Hi, Lesby. I don't, I see this whole thing is new to me, so I'm so excited. Um, so hi, Lesby. I love all of you. Um, but when we moved to Texas, um, we did something kind of unique for us. We became goat farmers. You think I'm kidding, right? Because you look at me and you go, hey, that lady's a goat farmer. You know, isn't that what I like exude when you meet me? You go, I bet that lady has goats and chickens and knows how to shovel poop and drive a tractor. I could do all those things, and I do them pretty good. So I thought, I, since we've been away for a while, since some of you are just like old good friends and some of you I've never met before, I just wanted to give you just a tiny peek into our goat farm. Can I do that? Can I indulge, will you indulge me? Just a little in that, okay. Picture, aw, look at that. Okay, this is my husband, me, and Will, our youngest son, and this is Mickey. This is our billy goat. We would call him a buck, because I'm in the goat no. Um, we got him when he was six weeks old, and now he is in charge of growing our farm. We'll, we'll say it that way. That's his one job. He's very excited about it, <laughs> and he does it very well. So that's Mickey. Okay, picture. This is me shoveling poop in the barn. Well, actually, I think I was doing hay. You noticed the hay fork and not a shovel. But this is how I look two thirds of the time. I've got a hat on, my sunglasses. If you'll notice here, can you see what this is? This is a weapon. Why would I need a weapon? Rattlesnakes. Yeah, ooh, rattlesnakes. <clears throat> I have my, my clogs on, I have my like barn proof boots and everything. So that's me in the barn. Okay, go ahead, picture. Oh, this is why we have goats. They're so cute. This is Uma. She it was the first baby goat born at Top of the Rock Farm. So Mickey was very close with her mother, Oakley because we had twin goats, Annie and Oakley. Um, actually, no, she's not Oakley's baby. This is Mama's baby. What am I thinking? There's another goat called Mama, and this is her baby. But this was the first, so she's kind of one of my favorites, because she was the first goat born at Top of the Rock. Who doesn't love a baby goat? Have you ever played with a baby goat? Have you? They're fun. 
Are you a little afraid of them if you haven't? Like my mom came to visit and she's like, is it gonna touch me? Like, I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Do I have any more pictures? I can't remember. Aw. This is Will again, and this is our last baby that we had born, and her name is Boots. But there's just nothing more fun than baby goats. Is that it? Oh, there's Mickey all grown up. That's what he looks like now. He comes up to our porch. Classy. But when we started on this endeavor, I knew nothing about goats, right? I had no idea what you need to do for them. I didn't know what they need. I didn't know how to care for them. And so I started asking a lot of questions and have a lot of farmers laughing at me because they're like, this lady doesn't know what she's doing. She's going to do this and quit in two minutes when it gets messy and it gets dirty and they have babies and that's really gross and there's lots of stuff that happens. But you know what? I'm committed. Am I not committed to these goats? I love these goats. I love these goats with all my heart. I almost cry when I have to sell them. But there's something that have, the goats have taught me, and I'm wondering if this lesson might apply to anybody else, is no matter what we think we can do, sometimes there's things that we can do that we don't know we can do because we just haven't done them. Does that make sense? You need to gain experience things. You need to try things. So all of you need to go home today and buy a goat. <laughs> I mean, that's just really the, the whole point of my message is buy a No, that's not the point of my message. My point is, is that there's oftentimes things that we don't think we're suited for either because I married a farm kid. We grew up in Missouri in the rural area, and his family thinks that it's absolutely hilarious that I love to farm the way that we farm because it's not who I seem to be or who I am. If you'd known me many years ago, I would never have touched a goat with a 10-foot pole, let alone snuggle one up next to me and like kiss it. But my mind has changed because I've had a different experience. I tried something that, you know, sounded, like I think that would be kind of cool. And I've really discovered that at heart, I'm a goat farmer. I was wondering, what are some areas in our lives that maybe that applies to all of us in other ways? Maybe it's applying for a new job. You're like, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think I'm, I could do that or I'm cut out for that. Maybe I'm not qualified for that. Maybe I need to learn some things to do that. Maybe it's reaching out and joining a small group. I don't know about that. that. That's weird. I'd be committed once a week, and then, you know, people would know me and ask me questions. Or what about it's making a new friend? You know, that person always seems to be around, and both of us are alone. Maybe we could be friends. Maybe it's a volunteer opportunity that you've been kind of holding back on. You know, could I go sit and do stuff with kids? In South Point, could I volunteer on my kids' sports team? What about Habitat for Humanity or different things in the community? Or maybe it's not even something like that, but it's being willing to look at something that you've believed for a long period of time from a different perspective. And actually ask yourself hard questions about why you believe what you believe about that. But if we're followers of Christ, it's our responsibility to follow his commands. And sometimes that takes us out of our comfort zone. Sometimes it takes us into territories where we're unsure or we think we're unqualified or don't know anything about. And that's okay. Because we can learn. Because we're responsible for making sure that his heart is communicated effectively to those around us in the world. We cannot profess to be followers of Christ and then fail to follow through on what it is we're saying with our mouths. Because what God says is important in his kingdom is often what's overlooked or ignored in our society. 
when we realize this whole thing, that God's economy is a little different, and things that are important to him may not be important to us here in this world, meaning our society as a whole, we begin to see the true purpose and unexpected ways that God is in our lives. We begin to experience this strange joy that sometimes doesn't make sense or even is understood by ourselves or those around us. It can be baffling. You start doing something that's important in God's economy and people around you are, are, are thinking you're crazy or they look at you and say, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that. You're not like that. But you may just fall in love with it because you know it's the right thing to do. That's how I feel about the goats. I don't know everything and I'm learning every single time that something happens but it gives me this unexplainable joy. In scripture, we have many, many letters written to us um, through, from people way back in Jesus' day. And we're gonna look at one verse today, just one verse out of the book of James. Now James um, is the brother of Jesus. So this guy grew up with Jesus. Think about that. What would that be like to have Jesus as a brother in your house? Who here has any sibling rivalry? <laughs> yeah, ain't nobody raising their hand, huh? I know that's not true because I have children and siblings. But James was like the ultimate Jew. He knew his faith. He knew his religion. He knew exactly how to keep the law and do whatever it is that he was supposed to do to practice his faith. And then his brother changes everything by coming back from the dead. James was still a practicing Jew after this and he wrote this whole letter. But he wrote it specifically to Jewish people so I'm speaking to those of you today who are followers of Christ. The message for you today is specifically for you. If you're not a follower of Christ, this message can apply to you, absolutely. But if you follow Christ, this message is a must do. It's a non-option. James spends the first part of this letter talking about behaviors and things that need to happen. He says things like, be slow to anger and be quick to listen. He says that if you, um, don't, if you know what the law says and you don't do it, it's like looking at yourself in a mirror and then looking away and forgetting what you look like. And then he says this in verse 26. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. I think that's clear. Does anybody else think that's clear? Is that a clear sentence? Does it leave a lot of room for ambiguity? Is that a word? Any English teachers in here? Ambiguity? Am I getting it right? Somebody help me. I'm texting now. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's simple, but not easy, right? It's a simple concept, but it's not easy. I want to make two quick observations about this passage, and the first one is this. Caring for the orphan is close to the heart of God. I mean, that is, that is simple. That is true. Early childhood experiences, both good and bad. Not yet. We'll get there, don't worry. God thinks this is big in his economy. Right? He thinks that caring for children and people who are overlooked, forgotten, and oppressed is big. It's a mandate. He says you can't do it. He says don't do it if you feel like it or if you have extra time. He says that's what's pure and true. That's a pure and true expression of our faith. 
we can often get so distracted by other things that we neglect the huge things. And often I think that's because the huge things seem so darn huge, right? When I say care for the orphan, what do you think of? Do you feel like that's easy task or a small task where you could just like volunteer for four hours on a Saturday and that's it? It's not. Parts of it can be, but it's not that pure and true expression of our faith. The second observation is this, what we do, what we are asked to do won't make sense to everyone. How many of you have ever done something that doesn't make sense to somebody else? That's every single day of my life. Sometimes when we are following that pure expression of our faith, other people around us will think we have lost our minds. I showed you a picture of my, my youngest son, um, Will, who is seven, um, going on, I swear, 27. Um, he is so stinking ornery. Am I wrong? He's, he's just ornery. He's just, he's just all mischievous boy, and he has this smile that will just absolutely melt your soul. You know, he's doing all these really, really naughty things, and then he's like, I love you, mommy. And I'm like, it's okay. And then I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Get my mind back. But I'm not in my 30s. I know I'm not in my 20s either. It's okay. You don't have to think that I'm 27. I'm a little old to have a seven-year-old. I'm not super old to have a seven-year-old. But I'm a little old to have a seven-year-old. Okay? When we started, my husband and I started many years ago doing foster care right here in good old St. Mary's County, um, we didn't really understand or know where our journey was going to lead us. But we had two teenage biological kids. I think the, boys, the older boys were 15 and 16 at the time. And now they are 25 and 27. Anybody who knows Zach, Zach turned 27 two weeks ago, and I think I need some sort of group therapy because I don't know how that's possible. 27? Oh, my gosh. But anyway, um, people would come to us and say, why are you, why are you doing this? Because um, you guys are almost to the end. Anybody in here with grown-up kids? Do you have an end? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You, those little things, they still come back. They come back home, and they'd say, well, this is really going to upset your life. You know, you won't be able to just do what you want to do. You know, Warren, like I said, he just retired two years ago. We're living the retired life, which is exactly the same as the active duty life. It's great. You know, we are traveling nonstop. No, we're not. Mm -mm. You know, we just, you know, live this, this just jet-setting life of leisure, which is all false. We don't do any of that. We have young kids. If we didn't have young kids, I don't know that we'd be doing that anyway, right? I, I think that, you know, the idea that was placed in our heads was, if you do this, it will cost you too much. And I can tell you that, yes, it has cost us a lot. It has cost us our privacy. It has cost us friendships, some family relation. People don't understand it. They think we're nuts. We are nuts. But that's okay. I don't mind. Because I really know and was convicted years and years ago that God placed that in my heart, that pure and genuine expression of my faith would be to care for others. I didn't know how that was going to come about, but for us and for you in some way, it will come in caring for someone who is overlooked and specifically an orphan. What an orphan means has a big definition. There is not a minute of my day now that I don't spend doing something related to caring for an orphan. Whether it's washing their underpants or giving a message like this to how to get other people to take up the same mantle and join us in this race. Because this time, it's a race. Kids who are overlooked 
or come from hard places don't have time to wait. Because everything that is happening in their lives is happening right now. And trauma is cumulative. One trauma and another trauma and another trauma until you have a human being who spends their life living in fear, whether they understand it or not. When did Jesus ever say, ever say live in fear, I don't mind? The most common phrase in the Bible, be not afraid. Be not afraid. How do people who are in hard places or feel overlooked understand not to be afraid? Everything around them is telling them to be afraid. That's where we come in. We come alongside that and whisper, be not afraid, for I am with you. I would not change a thing about this process that we have been through and that we will still go through. This process has changed my life and my faith more than anything else, than any conference, any Bible study, any message, any song, but the practice of pure and genuine religion has changed me to a hopefully more Christ-like person. My economy starts to change. How I invest my time and my energy has changed. And what I think and believe about the other has changed. When you have to sit with somebody in their pain, it gives you a different perspective on how that pain got there and what needs to be done about it. And I am humbled to walk that walk. I know now you are all really, really pumped up and excited about orphan care. You're thinking, yeah, sign me up. But I'm asking you to pray. What are my next steps? And I'm going to give you three chances for right here where you are. That first step is become a foster parent. Near and dear to my heart, I will say this for the rest of my life, become a foster parent, become a foster parent, become a foster parent. Did you know that in St. Mary's County right now, which this isn't a huge number, but it's a big number if you're one of them, there are 65 kids in St. Mary's County in a foster placement. St. Mary's isn't that big of a place, is it? Calvert, sorry I didn't get your statistics, but I don't know, but I'm sure that your local Department of Social Services can give you that information. Nationally, in the whole entire country, in 2016, the number of foster kids in the United States was 437,000 approximately. Nearly half a million kids. That rose from 2012 from 396,000. Why do you think that is? So much of that has to do with people's pain and addiction. So many more kids are coming into foster care because of drug addictions and abuses. Grandparents are raising their grandchildren. And as a church, we can't not look at that. We can't sit idly by and just let it happen because it's bad choices or somebody else's decision. These kids didn't choose it. They were born into it. Foster care is tough. What'd you say? Yeah. It's tough. It's, it's easy and hard and awful and beautiful and so very, very complicated. But I wouldn't change a minute of our journey. Everything that we experienced helped us learn and grow. It helped me understand how God sees me. It helped me learn to put myself behind the needs of another on a routine basis. And those lessons far outweigh any free time that I thought I might have. 
It's worthwhile, it's good, and it's important. I live in Texas now, so things are, uh, the, the system is different there, um, but sometimes we have kids that are sleeping in, in social service offices because they're removed and there's no place to take them. They spend the night in somebody's office after they've probably seen cops, social workers, their parents are upset and they're crying, they don't know what's going on, they feel guilty because if they hadn't said anything, none of this would be happening. Can you imagine? Could you be a place that a child could come to feel safe, or at least be safe, for a little while? Your second opportunity for a next step is adoption. There are over 100,000 children in the US that are currently available for adoption through the foster care system. These are children whose parental rights have been terminated and, and there's no family member who's going to take care of them for the rest of their life, so they are waiting for a home. They're waiting for parents. This, to me, is super hard because I want to go to the website and like say, yes, I want everybody. I want everybody to come to my house I, because that's how I am. But my request is to you because I know, realistically, I can't. My husband has put the big ol' eh on any more kids. But he didn't say that about you. You guys have the option. You guys can. That's my mission now, is to help everyone else understand that, yes, you can do this. And it falls to the church because of our faith expressions of caring for the widow and the orphan to be first in doing this. There are about 300,000 churches, give or take, in the U.S., and about 275,000 of them are in Texas. <laughs> but if one family, one family, from one-third of the churches in the United States adopted a waiting child. There would be no more waiting children. Now, I'm going to be very clear with you, though. Our waiting children are tough. They have trauma. They have histories of abuse and neglect. Life has taught them that adults are not trustworthy and providing a safe home with nice things will not make the difference. What they need is someone who will walk with them through their trauma, who will accept that they are going to misbehave, that they are going to test you, and that they will and that you will continue to be there no matter what they throw at you. Because isn't that what Jesus does for us? We can't be bad enough to make him quit loving us. We can't mess up enough to get him to forget about us. He doesn't like the stuff we do. He doesn't say, hey, that's okay, go ahead, do that. He hopes for better for us. We hope for better for our kids. But we're there with forgiving and loving arms which abound in grace upon grace upon grace. Because these kids, and probably now a lot of them are adults, never got what they needed. How can they be expected to behave like they did? You have the option of adopting internationally. I don't really know much about this, but after the sec um, second service, we're going to be having a panel um, in the Career Center that if you are interested in going to another country and pursuing adoption that way, there will be questions answered there. We will have people from the Department of Social Services, and they'll talk to you about foster care. Um, and then also, we'll talk about my point three coming up here in just a minute. But I don't want to like, let the cat out of the bag, OK? Because this is so awesome, in my opinion. International adoption is a great option. I just can't speak to it as much because I just don't know as much about it. But to me, anytime a kid gets a home, it's a win, right? You guys say yes. 
I'm sweating, I need feedback. Okay, now we're, we're percolating. Your option number three is volunteer to be a mentor with South Point Church. You guys have an opportunity to mentor a child. You get to kind of try it out, right? This is gonna be a, a wonderful, wonderful option because I realize that not everyone can adopt or foster. I get that. And honestly, can I be real with you? Who, can, who says I can be real with you? Can I be real? Some of you just shouldn't. I'm honest because you know, this is not, this is a specialized thing. I think more people could do it than, than think they can because I can, I can train you. I can, I'm a good trainer. I can do it. I can train, but not everybody should. Not everybody should. So this is an option that might just really, really, really be important for you. Because if we can prevent children from coming into foster care, by providing supports before that happens, that is the best. If families can stay intact, stay together, and be healthy and function, that is a huge win. Because all these things, remember I said trauma was cumulative, all these things that happen over our lifetime impact us for the rest of our life. It's not like, oh, it's good, that happened when they were a kid, they'll get over it. That's not how this works. I have a video that I want y'all to watch. Um, it talks about what is the ACEs score. It's called your Adverse Childhood Experiences Score. And this, um, it's a quiz, you can Google it, you can take it, but you can see about all the different things that happen in your childhood and what type of effect it can have on the rest of your life. So let's, let's play that um, video. Early childhood experiences, both good and bad, have a large impact on our lifelong health. They even affect how our brains develop. Positive stress, like meeting a new caregiver, is a healthy part of early childhood. But negative or adverse childhood experiences, like abuse, neglect, or parental substance abuse, can create toxic stress. And toxic stress, built up over time, has been linked to poor health conditions later in life, like obesity and heart disease. But there are steps we can take to reduce the impact on our children's health. Building strong, safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, both at home and in our community, can help prevent adverse childhood experiences and encourage the healthy development of our children. Ensuring children have a supportive adult they can count on also combats toxic stress, builds stronger brains, and sets children up to be successful members of our society. This adult doesn't have to be a parent, any family or community member can help. By working together, we can help children thrive and build resilience to life's challenges. Quick peek into the world of ACEs. But what it said was that when you have adverse childhood experiences, if you just have one stable, caring adult relationship that can change the score, if you're a mentor for a child, you can change the score of their life. You can help them have a longer, healthier life. To be a mentor here at South Point Church, they're going to train you, they'll interview you, make sure that you're not like, cuckoo, right? I'm not sure I could pass, honestly. You'll have background check. You will make a one-year commitment to the child, and you will mentor for one hour for, per week, and then there will be quarterly events as a group to connect with other people, develop those important adult relationships outside of that one-to-one -one mentorship, and help, kill, help kids build skills that will benefit them. Because mentorship, mentorships have proven to show positive change in children's lives with results such as increased academic success. They may not be a straight A, but they may go from failing to C's. Is that academic success? Heck yeah, it is. We love C's at my house. You might have decreased behavioral problems. When a kid knows that there's somebody in their corner, they will behave differently. 
They will challenge you, but they will behave differently. They may not get in trouble at school anymore because they know that there's somebody looking into what they're going to be doing, and they don't. They need to develop that relationship. For girls, they are four times less likely to become a bully with a positive mentorship role. For boys, that is two times less likely to become a bully. And their ACEs score will go down, meaning that they will have less chronic illness throughout their life, they will have less mental illness throughout their life, and a li literally longer life span. You can make the difference. Because orphans come in a lot of different packages. Consider what those are. After the second service, you will also be able to discuss becoming a mentor here at South Point Church. We'll be in the Career Center. I heard there was cookies. So if you want a cookie, show up. It'll be good. Um, but please, I just really implore you, consider not if you will help orphans, but how. Because I know that if you're here in worship, you have an interest in expressing your faith in a pure and true way. Can you pray for an orphan? Can you pray for kids who you know are having a tough time? That's, that's it. You can do that. I know you can. I know you can. And boy, do you, they need it. And those of us who are in the trenches, we need your prayers too. Because so many times we feel like giving up because it's hard. Would all the teachers in the room raise their hand? School teachers, school teachers, you are all my heroes. I did one kindergarten Valentine party and needed like to go to, I had to, I had to nap, y'all, I had to nap. You guys are the best. For what I have to say to you is thank you. I know you do this. I know you do this every single day. Don't be afraid. Be encouraged. Because you are lowering ACE scores every day. And that's the only time anyone's going to encourage you to lower a score, right? Yes. It's good work that you're doing. And we thank you. We thank you for what you do. In closing, like I said before, we don't do foster care anymore. My husband said no more kids. I keep bringing goats instead, so technically I'm bringing kids. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Um, but I have an, an, a job. I actually work. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, they pay me when I go there. Um, I'm a social worker, so not much. But um, I, I work for a child placement agency. In foster care, there are uh, private agencies that place kids into foster care. And our agency also has two residential treatment centers. And I'm a case manager there, so I manage a full caseload of kids in foster care and their foster families. So this is like a dream job for me, because I still get to hang out with these kids, and I get to support their foster parents, which is so amazing because I have had the pleasure of working with some amazing, amazing foster parents. Um, but I wanted to share with you a story about one of our families. They actually did not foster, but it's an adoptive story um, where they have just adopted their daughter who turns 18 in August. They adopted her a couple of weeks ago. Um, they go to a church in Fort Worth, um, and I believe it's called High Ridge Church, um, where they saw a video that was produced by an organization called Hope Fort Worth, which makes videos about waiting children. Um, they saw the video. They were motivated by an expression of their faith that is pure and true. They've adopted once before, so they knew what they were getting into. Um, and they came to our agency and they said, can you help us? We want to adopt this girl before she turns 18, which is in August. And they started in January. So we worked very hard to try to get everything going, meet up with them, get the girl there. You know, all these things happened. 
But they knew that their faith was motivating them to be the family for this girl. She's had a really bad go at life. She entered foster care for the first time when she was very young, under the age of two. She was adopted at age four, was in her adoptive home for many years until age 13, when she was abused again and re-entered foster care. And she spent from age 13 to 17 in foster care with one failed adoptive placement there and also multiple foster homes. Do you think she's super easy to take care of? She's not as bad as it could be. But she has significant needs. But guess what? Her mom and dad don't care. They're willing to do the work. They know that it's going to be tough and it's going to be hard, but they're willing to do it. These people have become my new heroes. I adopted little kids, which was kind of easier, but not necessarily. But they wanted to give her a family. The best part about this story is when we were at the adoption hearing, everybody standing around the, the bench, the whole court was filled with, with social workers and lawyers and people who had been on this girl's case since she was 13. So four years, almost five, of, of, of hoping with her, of working, of praying, come to this moment to see her adopted. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. And her little brother, who is in her adoptive family, I think he's around 11, they, the judge actually asked the siblings, what do you think about her being part of your family? Which sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. And the older siblings spoke and were very well-spoken and eloquent. And, and the little guy takes his turn and he tears up. And he says, I'm just really glad she has a family because she deserves it. We all cried. It was a beautiful moment. But guess what? He had been adopted too. So I'm telling you, if you've been adopted by God, help other people find that family too. We deserve it. We deserve to be reunited with our Father. I've given you a lot to consider. I know it's a feel-good message. We're going to leave here, and you're going to go, "Woohoo! Teresa was super fun today. But I wanted to challenge you during this series of Won't You Be My Neighbor? Because being neighbors is hard and messy. And it means caring for the orphan. Because that is the purest and most genuine expression of our faith. Amen. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I just thank you for being here this morning. I thank you that I have the opportunity to come back and see these beautiful people. I know that you will stir their hearts to do your work and your will, however you would have it done. Lord, we submit ourselves and our actions to you that we can know and understand how it is that you need us to do what you need us to do. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.